Welcome back. Recently, Adobe updated the Lightroom and Lightroom Classic software with some pretty new amazing features. And I've already made a video that talks about this new feature, but in short, they did some improvement with speed and stability. If you are using Lightroom Classic and you are a Sony shooter, well, good news, you can now shoot stutter directly with Lightroom Classic, which is a big news for Sony shooter. The Lensburg tool that was in beta for about a year now is no longer in beta, and you should get some much better result out of it. But I guess the biggest news is that you can now generative remove directly in Lightroom Classic and Lightroom. So you no longer need to go to Photoshop to remove unwanted objects in your images. So in this video, I'm going to take you through these two new features, which are the generative remove and lens blur. And hopefully by the end of this video, you should have a better understanding of this new feature so you can just download the updates and start editing right away. Let's get into it. For this video, I'm going to use Lightroom Classic, but it's good to know that the Generative Remove and Lens Blur are also available for Lightroom Mobile and the standard Lightroom app. And you should now be able to see my screen. So here I have a photo of a sunset I took on Vancouver Island. And so it was shot with a long lens and you had the sun setting and you had this uh, bunch of people in the front, which is why I took the photo. I thought, I thought it was fun to see all of these people looking at the sunset and just enjoying the moment. But let's have some reason that you wish to just concentrate on the sunset and remove all of those person in, in the front here. So what you're going to do is that you're going to go to your develop module here and you'll see a new icon here between the uh, crop tool and the little like, uh, I think it's the red eye tool. And it looks like an eraser. And before that, you used to have a clone stamp. So you're going to click on this, and this is where you're going to find the Generative AI Remove tool. You still have the same tool, so you still have your healing tool that you must be used to, and then the uh, clone one, but we won't be touching those. Instead, we're going to concentrate on the first one. And so just by looking at the interface, you can see it's very clean. It does say that it's early access here because it's still in beta mode. And then you have a couple of uh, buttons here. So you have the Generative AI, which I already tick. Then you have object aware, and then you have size, opacity, and then tool overlay. So I'm going to go through those first. But basically what you do is that you're gonna launch that tool here, and already by going on the image, you can see that you have a brush. So by using this side, you can resize your brush here. And then if you're using a Mac trackpad, or I don't know about the Windows trackpad, but if you use two fingers, you can also like increase and decrease the size of your brush here. And what you're going to do is simply paint over what you want to remove here. So I'm going to paint over all of those people and as you can see, I'm very, very rough with my selections and it's it's on purpose. So I'll explain that in a second. But even here, I'm going to go here. Maybe I'm going to do one group and I'm going to go another one here. Perfect. And finally, that person here on the left. Okay, so now I have my, my selection and you can see it's really rough. But the reason why I'm doing this is that the it's not like in Photoshop where you used to use the pen tool and you had to be very, very careful and select all around your subject here. What is going to happen is that the, the software needs a little bit of context of what you want to remove. And so let's say that you paint like very carefully around a subject and you miss a tiny little piece. Well, the software is going to try to replicate that small piece and you might have some weird results. So that's why don't be afraid to paint over. But now let's say that you're still like thinking, oh, it's way too much. I painted too much. So no worries here. You have the mask refinement tool here on the right. And then I'm just going to click on subtract here. And let's say that finally I wanted this, this person. Oh, I want to keep this person. So I'm just simply going to remove what I did. So it's very simple. Put it back here. So now that you have selected all these subjects you wish to remove with the red paint, you're going to go back to the panel and you're simply going to click apply. And here you see a new window and what's happening is that it's sending the request to the Adobe servers and using the Firefly engine. So it's good to know that to use and to remove, you need to be connected to the internet and then the speed will vary depending on your internet speed. So if you thought that you could use the generative remove in the middle of the woods at your cabin and you have no internet connection, well, you won't. So then we're going to wait here for it to, to be done. Perfect. So already here you can see there is a couple of things that are happening. All of the people here are gone. But for some reason here, you can see that person here, he didn't remove it. So that's okay. We're going to delete this mask and we're going to go over it again and try to, it's a little bit slow with the screen recording. I'm going to paint over once more time and we're going to apply once again. 
like I said earlier, it's still in beta mode. So sometimes you may have some like result like this where one of your masks isn't applied correctly. And as you can see, all of these subjects I painted over to be removed are now gone. And you can see a couple of different things happening here. So first of all, you see just like four icon here. And that's the great thing about this uh, generative remove tool is that you don't need to paint in one go. You can create multiple masks or like paint, whatever you want to call it. And uh, then you kind of like generate all of them at the same time. But the cool thing is that they're still independent from each other. So here on the panel, you have a couple of new things. You can see that here you have like the, the, the size and the opacity that is the brush. So that's the same thing as earlier. But now you also have a new thing here called variations, one out of three. So every time you use the generative tool, it's going to generate three different options uh, of what you've like trying to paint over. So here I'm on the mask on the left. And you can see that if I go over the two va different variations, I get different results. So here, here it, it decided to put a little seagull on it. Why not, after all? Um, but you can really just decide and go a bit back and forth and see which one uh, like you like the most. I think the number two here is nice for the curve of the, the rocks here. And, same, and then on this one, you can see it seems a little bit fuzzy, um, actually. So let's see if we can go to two. Okay, and then you really see the difference the variations can bring to the table. So then you can choose which one you like the most, okay? Here, I can see that it creates this little weird wave, you know, on the rock. So this is kind of look unnatural. So we're going to, need to try variation number two, and already it's much more natural, okay? Let's go number three, perfect. And here, I'm quite happy with the result I got, but let's say you're not happy with those three new variations that it gave you. You can always click refresh, sorry. And then what's gonna happen, it's gonna send back the request to the cloud and then bring you three new variations. So it's not like you don't need to like start over and repaint over, you can always try. And if after a second or third try, you still can't get correct result, then you might need to fully reset and paint over maybe more precisely or be more broad to include more of it. Okay. And then you have also the visual spots here, which is basically what you had in the healing tool where you could show the lens dust. And you could, of course, use generative remove for lens dust, but I think it's a little bit overkill. And especially if you like, you have a very dirty uh, camera sensor, uh, it might be easier just to use the, the healing tool, but it's really up to you at the end of the day. So here I'm pretty happy with what I got. Um, so yeah, I'm going to show before and after. And you can see it did a very clean job. And it was a very easy photo, right? It was just the sea. You was like you had the dark uh, rock here. So it wasn't a very complicated scenes, but you can really be have an idea of the results here. And you can see a couple of weird artifacts. So here it's a little bit blurred. Here it's like very sharp, and here you have some sort of like black thing. Um, here, the same thing here, you have kind of like a, the wave on the left, they don't really match with the one on the right. So by really taking like a sharp eye to it, you might see some def default there and there. But as just as a big picture, I'm still very impressed with what I got. And to fix that, I would probably need just to um, get maybe like smaller mask and trying to refine my selection or simply just try to refresh the variation here. All right, let's find another photo here. So I'm going to go to this image here. And here I have another scene shot on Vancouver Island on the other side of the, of the island. And you can see I have a subject here, which uh, I wanted a subject here, but let's say for some reason that person just walked into my landscape and I wanted to remove it. Well, it's very simple. Again, we're going to go to our eraser. By the way, you can also bring that tool with the uh, letter Q on your keyboard, okay? I'm going to zoom in and I have my brush selected here and I'm going to paint over this subject here, maybe doing a more precise job than I did on the previous image, um, but making sure that I really angle up the whole subject, right? Because here, for example, you can see here by the leg, and by the hood here, I think I'm a bit too close from the mask. Okay. All right. So I'm going to click apply. All right. And now the subject is gone. So already here, if we stay zoom on the image, you can see a couple of different things. Um, first of all, you can see that this is sharp rocks, but there is some like fuzziness to this. So I'm going to click on the mask here and I'm going to try a different variation. 
that's not too bad that's added something else all right i think number two here is the best of the bunch because it was able to regenerate some of that log here and again if i we de zoom like you don't longer have this subject here so it's a very good it was a small subject in the overall image but it did a very good job to it so it's like you have no idea there was someone here and before that, even for that kind of subject, because it was kind of a complicated subject, you had some log, you had some of the beach, you had some of the water, some of the rock in the background. I'm pretty sure the Lightroom tool in the past wouldn't have been able to remove that. So you would have need to like, you know, edit and send to Photoshop, but you no longer need to do that with this new update, which is great. And I think it's going to save a lot of time to photographer that mainly use Lightroom or Lightroom Classic. All right, let's move to our final image for the generative remove. And here we have a lovely kitty. So I chose this image for two reasons. Number one, it was shot on an iPhone 13 Pro. So the sensor is 12 megapixel. And so there is less data than you would get on your typical uh, camera. So there is less thing for generative remove to get inspiration from to, to fill that area. And what I want to do is remove these two lamps and the mat here. And the second reason is that you can see that it was used, uh, used the portrait mode. And this means that this is a JPEG or EF file. And there is already some sort of like algorithm and like computer photography happening in this image. So it's not a raw file. And I want to see if generative remove is able to work with that kind of like limited data. So I'm going to go to my tool here and on this one i'm also going to show you what happens when you click object object aware basically what's going to happen is that it's going to try to um it's going to take a look at what you're painting over and analyze what you're painting over and try to get the mask to get the same shape as what you're painting over so here you can see i did like basically a circle okay so if i like make it rounder here okay and i'm going to release you can analyze the scene and you can see that despite having like a kind of like a circle it tried to do the shape of the lamp so you have like some very sharp uh, edges here and it can be useful in some um, in some uh, images but i think here the issue with that is that it might you might have like some artifact because the mask has some very straight line and it might maybe unnatural but we're gonna try it regardless so only thing is that I'm going to refine my brush because I think it took too much of the kitty's butt here. Wonderful. And maybe like this. Okay. And let's click apply. Okay. And here you can see a couple of things happening. So first of all, the two lamps are gone, which is quite amazing because it took quite a big chunk of the image. But at the same time, it did create some, I don't know what it cloned from here, but you can see there is some weird object. It looks like it's a rock. Um, so let's see if the variation number two changed this. Ooh, wow, okay. So here it actually generated a second chair, probably cloned from this one. It's actually pretty amazing because it only had like a portion of that chair. So all right, all right. Um, and here it does something you know, not too bad, but the shadow is kind of odd. And you can see here at the edge of the table. So I kind of like that. So you can see it's kind of odd, first of all, because if I remove here before and after, you can see that the table was, was stopping right behind the lamp. So it did extend the length of the table, which is not really true to the real table that I shot. But you also have the, the, the chair here. So it, it, it brought new elements. Um, so then it's just you going to decide if you find, you think it was like, the way the scene was, if it's just a, since it's a small detail, it just had a chair, how did it kind of like, change from the original scene so it's 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 really up to you and what you think about generating content in your images i'm just i'm not gonna talk about it but you, you get you get the point um i think i'm going to go with generation number two or we can just try to see by clicking refresh what happens okay so here like just i was saying earlier it kind of removed that chunk of the table um, but now the table is a little bit odd because it's kind of blurred out. So you could, it could work pretty well in that case because I use the portrait mode. Um, but again, let's see what the variation number two did. Okay, here it extends the table once again. And here it's not good. I actually like the chair, so it's too bad. But I think number one in that case is the best. So here you can see it did an amazing job at removing this massive two lens. 
and to keep the shadow of the key, although I think the shadow of the key would be slightly different here, but yes, and even on the fur here, you can see there is some artifact here where it did actually a much better job when with the first set of uh, variations. Okay, but at least here you can see that my kitten is they're still a bit blurred, so there is some weird thing happening with the, the texture. Um, but overall, again, looking at the big pictures, it did quite a good job at removing those two massive objects out of this uh, image. Um, yeah, pretty amazing. And finally, the last thing I want to show you is I'm going to delete that and start over. So now let's say that every time you see I have to paint over and then I have to go to the menu here on the right to make sure that I wanted, if I wanted to refine my selections and then click apply. But now let's say that you're very um, sure of like the selection you're going to make. Well, before you're going to paint over in that tool, you're going to press Command on Mac or Control on PC. You're going to hold it and then you're going to paint over. And then what's going to happen is that it won't ask you to refine your selection. So you might save a little bit more time by doing it that way if you're sure of your selections and of your like painting skill over the, the subject. So now I'm going to release the mouse and the command and you can see it already started like to do the gently remove. So that way you kind of like shave a couple of seconds and it doesn't make you go to the right menu here. There are a few other things to note about Genetic Remove. So first of all, again, it is in early access. So you have the blue badge here, and uh, this means that you may get some funky results, just like here, for example. But at the bottom here, you see it says, provide feedback on generative uh, remove. I'm going to click on that. And here it brings a new window and it says to, it's an early features, they're still working on it. And please, if we can share feedback so they can make it better. Um, the only thing about this is that here it says, share feedback with our online forum. And you can always do that. You can just get the, on the Adobe um, forums and share feedback say it works in this case and that's in this one but before that i think for the length per at least you should have like a two little sum here and you could basically say oh i did a i, I did a good job so sum up or sum down and then if you did sum down you could be able to explain what happened and why it didn't work so here i could say for example the mask weren't aligned properly and that it did some uh, funky results so hopefully it will come with a just the next version of lightroom classic where you can share the feedback directly in lightroom classic but when it's there i highly encourage you to do so because the Adobe team is really taking into account that feedback and they need our help to make these AI features work better. And on that note, by the way, since it's using the internet and then since you have this pop-up window, you may think that um, your image are being sent to the clouds and that they have a copy of it. And it's not the case. So what it's sending is, I believe, like some uh, data about the images. But every time using that tool, don't think that the image is being sent to the cloud and that the Adobe uh, people have a copy of it. That's not the way it works. Another note is that Identity Remove can only generate content on a zone of 2K or 2000 pixel. So for example, here, this image was shot on a Canon R5C, which is a 45 megapixel sensor. So in this case, if I wanted to, let's say, paint over the full scene here, so I wanted to paint over the rocks, the people, the sea, and just fill it just with sea. Well, since that image is like around 8K, it wouldn't work. You would get some really funky result, and I'm not even sure it would let you do that. I haven't tried it, to be honest. But just keep in mind that it works better for uh, smaller parts. So if you're using a medium format camera with over 100 megapixel, you'll be able to generate less, at least for the moment. Maybe in future updates, you'll be able to expand that size, but for now it's 2000 pixel to get. Another thing to note about uh, Genity Remove is that you may have better result if you do a couple of things prior to applying it. So in these images here, it's like all again shown on an iPhone 13 Pro, but I don't really have an image here with the high ISO, but if um, you have an image at night or high ISO, uh, it's better to denoise the image first and then apply a generative fill or gently remove because if you don't um, and you apply gently remove first it's going to generate the texture of the noise okay so it's too much the aesthetic of the overall image and then afterwards you're going to apply the denoise well it's going to apply the denoise most likely to the the raw data but not to the uh, uh, generated 
content. So then you'll have some well denoised image, but the patch that you try to generate will have the grain from, from the images because you did it before, if I make any sense, right? So always, if you have um, I ISO image, denoise first with the tool here, with the AI tool, and then apply generative remove. Another tip is to apply generative remove before you crop image. So most of us, when we edit images, I mean, I know I'm included in there, the first thing I do when I look at image is uh, either recrop them or if I, my horizon is kind of one way or another, I, I just like kind of like reframe it so it's good and all. And then after that, I edit because I just can't stand looking at the image where it's like <laughs> like this. But with generative remove, remove sorry, uh, it's actually better to generate before you crop. And there is a reason behind it. So here on this image I have of those boats, I showed this on the iPhone. Um, you can see on the left here, I have a pole and on the right here, I have a little portion of a boat and I have the shadow here as well. So <clears throat> let's say here that I was going to crop this image <clears throat> I, and I'm cropping not because I want to remove stuff from the edge, <clears throat> excuse me, but because the frame is better for me, right? It's like closer to the subject. So I'm going to reframe like this. That's the frame I want for the composition, not because I'm trying to remove stuff out of it. I'm going to click enter. And here I still have a portion of the, the pole here. I want to remove it. So I'm going to remove it here. And maybe in this case it will work. Let's see, I'm going to apply it. But the thing is, is that um, since you're painting only on one thing, the despite the fact that you crop the image, the generative remove, I believe, is taking into account the overall image. So you cropped it and it thinks that, oh, on the left of this, there's still some pole. So it might use that pole as an example to generate what you're trying to, to, to fill in. So in this case, it works perfectly. So it doesn't work to my for my argument. But the Adobe people said it's better to um, do the generative remove before the crop to make sure you remove the full object out of the full image and instead of um, cropping, then applying the uh, genetic remove because it's the genetic remove, I believe, don't take in consideration the crop. It uh, uses the data from the whole image and not only what's in the crop. So that's why you should always do genetic remove first and then crop. And finally, the last thing is that when you wish to remove an object, you also have to remove the, the shadow it's casting. So if you don't, the algorithm is going to try to fill in um, the that zone with something. Since there is a shadow, it means that there must be something creating that shadow, right? So in this boat here on the right, um, it's better to, I'm gonna, oop, let's say if I only remove the boat here, I'm gonna only paint over the, the boat and uh, it is possible that it's going to generate something to replace the boat so that the shadow still makes sense, right? Um, and in this case, it did some. It didn't take in consideration the the shadow, but it put a little uh, flower there, and then the shadow could be something else. So it's always better to paint over the full object you wish to remove, and its shadow, uh, the shadow it's casting here. Comment. So you can actually click comment after you brush, and it will um, start generating right away. And here you can see already that you remove the shadow. So in my opinion, it's a bit cleaner. And then you can always just change the variations to see what uh, fits you the best. Um, but yeah, here you have the no longer the boat and no longer the shadows. So this is another thing to keep in mind is always remove the shadows cast by the object you wish to remove. Now let's talk about the lens blur feature, which you may be already familiar with since it was released with the last year update of Lightroom, but in beta mode. And as of the May update, it is no longer in beta mode. So technically you should get much better result out of it. And we're going to try that today. So here I have a photo, again, shot on iPhone 13 Pro. Um, and I use the uh, 77 millimeter lens, uh, which is the uh, telephoto equivalent. And with the telephone equivalent, you should see two things, uh, lens compressions and uh, depth of field. And then this image is very, very minor. I mean, because the sensor is so small, the depth of field is minimal. But the idea is that you have the subject here and then the, the background should be have more blur, have more bokeh. So we're going to try to work on that. This was a GNG file, so I did not use the portrait mode. I'm going to go to the lens blur here below transform. And the first thing you'll see is that it's no longer in beta mode and I'm just going to click Apply. So with Lens Blur, you don't really have to paint over the subject just yet. 
the painting and the it's more like the refining what you want to be blurred and not blurred and here right away you can see they did some very funky things so it knows that this woman here is the subject so that the background should be blurred but by default the blur amount here in the window is by 50 and this is way too much but i think it's a left it at 50 so you can really see which area are affected with that uh, feature um, but overall if you use this feature in the past you, you can see that the interface is much simpler much easier to understand and even the way the tools are laid out uh, what they do it's it's much better than what it used to be so that's a good thing the first thing we're going to do is look at the focus range here um, you still have the same two buttons so you have the subjects so it's the subject focus so it should know what you, what's in focus what's not in focus and by the way if you're using the portrait mode on an iphone it's able to take advantage of that depth um, map um, in this case you had to create it but something to keep in mind if you want to use portrait mode it also works with lens blur on top and then you have the little target mode here which basically allow you to uh, point to one area what you want it to be in focus and um, i think in this case it did a very good job at knowing what the subject was and what should be blurred so what we're going to try to do is just maybe refine the selections and make it a bit more natural so i'm going to have visual depth here and two things are happening now you can see the uh, the, the depth map so the you have two new thing here it says near and far so near will always be yellow and uh, or orange and then far is going to be the purple and the in between is going to be this kind of like uh, shade of uh, magenta uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that if it's purple it's out of focus it's just a it's just a color scale to show you uh, what's far what's close um, so here i can increase the range with the range tool what i want to be What's supposed to be close and since the focus is on the close what it should do is increase the um, the sharpness of the the foreground and keep the background blurred let's see what it did here okay so first of all those oops so you can see it did some odd um we can always refine this here, those uh, fern here are supposed to be on the same uh, focal plane as the person, so that's good. But then the river here is, this was like on the edge of a cliff, so the river was like below. So this shouldn't be um, in focus. Here it should be in focus, but here it should be blurred, which is good. And then you had some trees here, and you can really see that the level of blur is slightly different. Um, yeah. So let's see if we can refine this we're going to use the brush refinement tool Up, we're going to click on the little arrow here and then you have these two little buttons so then you can decide oh i want to add more uh, focus or you want to add more blur in this case i want to add more blur because here it really didn't do a good job at detouring the the face i'm going to see if i can paint over and do a better detour job okay so here it did some like voodoo thing and it's a bit better okay wonderful it's a little bit slow because i'm recording the display i'm gonna go down here um this supposed like we said this is supposed to be in focus this is supposed to be in focus i believe those trees here are supposed to be also in focus but i think it's such a narrow uh pixel here that it probably won't be able to to kind of mask them out um, i'm gonna see if i can oops no this i want to be in focus my bad so i'm gonna paint with the focus like i changed to focus so again i'm painting over area i want to be in focus okay and i'm gonna de-zoom here okay so now i have a better um refinement of what i want in focus and what i want in a blurred so the next thing is going to be to change the blur amount decrease it to make things look a bit more natural so usually by default it's 50 i think anything between 10 and 25 is more natural than, than 50 or above 50 um, and it's going to depend obviously what you're shooting and what what you are trying to get but overall i'm quite happy with what it did here um, i might try to paint over um that river like i was saying because to me it should be blurred there all right so here i did some refinement with my brush and if i show you the before and after you can see that oh actually it was a wrong image but if i 
remove the apply tool of the lens blur, you can see that it was very sharp everywhere and I apply it and already you have something that's closer to what you would get with a full frame. So very good job here. It needed a bit of work to refine your selections, but overall, um, again, looking at the big pictures, I think it did a very decent job of selecting a subject and making sure that the, the background was uh, blurred. And then there's two other tools that I haven't talked about, which are the bokeh, so those haven't changed. You can decide the shape of the bokeh you have. By default, it's this one. You have the cat eye then that looks like the old uh, EF uh, Canon lenses, but I think I'm gonna stay on the normal one. And then you have the boost. The boost, you might not see result all the time. Basically, it's going to boost the brightness of your bokeh. So, this is going to be particularly useful if you love shooting uh, street photography at night. So then you have your subject and in the background you have some car lights, some building lights, and then the bokeh with different lights, very pretty. So then you can then change the brightness of those with the boost here. Um, in this case, if I try it, I don't think, yeah, not much is happening because there is not really bright area in the background that should be bokeh. Maybe this, like those uh, yellow tree here, if it was uh, a sunny day, but in this case the boost is doing nothing. So if you don't see things happening when you use the boost, that's the reason. Again, it's just for the brightness of your bokeh. And let's try our final image for lens blur. So this was also shot on iPhone uh, 13 Pro in a DNG. So it's a raw file, no portrait mode. And you can already see there is some decent um, depth of field here because the I use the, my, the subject here, the camera I was holding was fairly close from the iPhone. So you can get some natural depth of field, but maybe you just want to increase it. So we're going to try to increase it with lens blur and see what happens. So we can click apply. And in this case, because there was some already some um, lens blur, like natural um, depth of field, it didn't really need to do a big job of detouring the subject. It was already done naturally in the, in the image. So lens blur can also be used to increase a depth of field you have already existent and just, so you want to boost it. Um, so even here it's at 50%, you can see it looks much more natural than the result we've tried in the past. So you could technically use lens blur even on a 35 millimeter um, camera, a full frame equivalent and, uh, enhance the lens blur or try to, while you're shooting with a, a full frame camera, you could technically try to mimic shooting medium format because medium format has a much uh, shallow depth of field and you could potentially try to mimic that with this tool. So that's very exciting to see what you can do with it. But again, I have not much to do here. Like the, it did perfectly uh, the detouring, it uh, creates some more blur here. So you have less of that uh, crest here. You can see the crest on the top of the trees. It's kind of blurred out with this. Um, I could always try to push it to like, to make it almost like it was shot on the 1.2 lens. And but even pushing it, it doesn't look bad because there was already some existent um, depth of field on the original image. Um, so yeah, it's, you can see if I go back and forth, really good. Um, results here. Let's see different bokeh. Yeah, you can see here, that was a good example. So you can really change the, the, the shape of the bokeh. And since we have some brighter area here, let's see if the boost will do something. And I don't think, yeah, it's not doing anything. I'm not surprised by that. So there it is. Um, again, if I visualize the, the, if I do the depth map here, you can see the focus range. It perfectly selected, obviously, the subject. It knows that this area is orange. It should be slightly more in focus. Then this one is magenta. It should be less in focus. And then you have the purple that's far. That's out of focus. And it didn't do anything. Um, it's not selected the sky here on the depth map for some reason. I think it knows. But yeah, again, really good result here. Um, in my opinion, I think I'm going to use it a lot for iPhone shot just to counter that kind of you can really get shallow depth of field with an iPhone camera, uh, other than using the portrait mode, of course. But by testing uh, back and forth images shot with the uh, portrait mode against lens blur, uh, I used to get better results with the lens blur. And on top of that, it allows me to shoot DNG with the iPhone. And so I can still get like all of the data from the sensor. So I can push the image further in uh, post productions. Whereas if I wanted to shoot portrait mode to get that um, that um, blur effect, that uh, depth of field effect, 
Well, portrait mode on iPhone and on most smartphones, it only can make a JPEG or ETH, which means that the image will be compressed, and then you'll have less room in post-production to play with the colors and the tone. So I like that lens blur because it's going to bring me the best of both worlds, uh, where I can still shoot the NG and raw files, and I can still mimic lens blur from a larger sensor. And so here are a few tips about using lens blur and get uh, better results. So as you could see in this image here with the camera compared to the car or the, the woman here, uh, the subject on this image was much simpler, right? You had like some like, you had the dog here, you had the sea, but you already had some sort of natural depth of field. So obviously what it did was simply increase it. And this is an example of like when it's going to work the best. It's a simple background. The subject is already quite well identified in the image. Whereas here, I had to do a bit more work to make it look um, decent. Obviously, if you like, like pixel peeping, you can see there is some like weird thing happening here, the mask. But by spending some time with it, you could refine it. Um, but here, the again, the background is a bit more complicated. You have some different tones, colors. You have some uh, branches, trees. It's it's a complicated background. And the car here has also on top of that, it has some reflections. And like I said, it can throw off the, the, um, the tool and the features. So it's something to keep in mind. It's you're still going to have to um, choose the subjects you wish to try lens burr on. And that's about it for this video. So hopefully by now you should have a better understanding of the Genity Remove and the Lens Burr, how to use them, the best practice, and how to get the best results out of your images. If you got something out of this video, please consider liking and subscribing so I can do more of this video in the future. And I'll see you next time.